Hi everyone, this is lecture 35. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about vapor compression refrigeration cycles. The picture here is of an aircraft being tested for cold regions operation. You can see that we have the aircraft inside a hangar here, obviously very cold with a lot of snow and ice that's accumulated on the ground as well as the aircraft. I showed this picture because we're going to be talking about refrigeration cycles today. The picture was kind of a dramatic example of trying to refrigerate an interior space. The topic of vapor compression refrigeration cycles, this is something that we've talked about actually quite a bit in the course. So much of what we talk about today is going to be review. You'll have seen just about everything that we talk about. The picture that we want to have in mind uh, for a refrigeration cycle looks like the picture on the left hand side. What we have is a compressor. That uh, So we have state one here coming out of an evaporator. We go through a compressor that puts energy into the fluid so we have some power going in. And then uh, we come out of that compressor, go through a condenser where we remove some heat into a hot reservoir there. So let's, let me just draw a hot reservoir at that point. Then we go from the condenser through a throttling valve. The throttling valve drops the pressure and temperature considerably and then it goes into an evaporator where we pick up energy from our cold reservoir and then we repeat the cycle. In a refrigeration cycle, our goal here is we want to cool down this cold reservoir. We want to try to get a lot of heat added from our, our cold reservoir into the evaporator. We're trying to cool down this region. This would be like our refrigerated space. Like your home refrigerator, this would be the interior of the refrigerator. We take that energy out of there through the evaporator. And the way we do that is we have some working fluid going through here, right? the temperature of the working fluid in the evaporator has to be colder than the refrigerated space so that we get the heat transfer going into the working fluid. So the temperature in the evaporator has to be less than the cold region or cold reservoir temperature. That way we get some heat transfer into the working fluid. Then what we do is we go through that compressor and the, what the compressor does is increases the temperature of the working fluid. And the reason we want to do that is when we move into the condenser, we want the temperature of the working fluid here to be higher than the temperature in the hot reservoir. It needs to be a higher temperature here so that we get some heat transfer into the hot reservoir. The temperature in the, the working fluid, that condenser has to be higher than that to, to get that heat transfer to occur. After we come out of the condenser, go through the throttling valve, the purpose of the throttling valve is to decrease the temperature sufficiently so that it's really cold here into the evaporator and again, we need that because we want the heat transfer from the cold region into the working fluid. So the throttling valve, the purpose is to really drop the temperature of the working fluid so that we can facilitate this heat transfer. And that's the cycle here. So if I sketch out the, the cycle on the TS diagram, our state one is typically located right along the saturated vapor line. Now we're moving in through the compressor. So what ends up happening is we go to a higher pressure, so a different isobar. So if it was a 100% isentropic efficiency, we would go to this point here, that would be 0.2s. But in reality, we go to, we increase our entropy a little bit. And so we go to state two there. Typically compressors operate best when you have pure vapor as opposed to a saturated vapor liquid mixture. So we're typically operating in a superheated vapor region. So there's 0.2, and again, the pressure at two is greater than the pressure at one. Then we go through the condenser to a saturated liquid state. So three, state three is located there, and that occurs at a constant pressure. So we follow that isobar over. Then we move from state three through the throttling valve to state four. Now that's inherently a non-isentropic process, so we end up moving to a higher entropy for state four. That throttling valve results in a, a very abrupt expansion of the working fluid. So it, uh, we know that if you have a, an abrupt expansion, that's uh, inherently irreversible. So that's why we go to a, a higher specific entropy for state four. And then through the evaporator from state four to state one, that occurs at a constant pressure. So we repeat our cycle in that manner. Here's the temperature of our working fluid in the evaporator. That's the temperature, state four, state one. It's the temperature in the evaporator. 
and we need that temperature to be a little bit less than the temperature inside a refrigerated space so that we get good heat transfer. So our temperature of our cold region might have to be somewhere up in here, for example, in our cold reservoir, we might want our temperature higher than that so that we get our heat transfer. And then the temperature in the condenser, that's going all the way along this path from two to three, that temperature we want to be higher than the hot reservoir temperature. So the hot reservoir temperature might be somewhere down here so that we get heat transfer out to the environment. So this kind of cycle, it's called a vapor compression refrigeration cycle. The reason we call it that is because we're dealing with the vapor dome here where we're dealing with vapor part of the cycle and then a saturated liquid vapor mixture, the other part of the cycle. This is a typical kind of cycle you would see in a refrigeration unit, like your home refrigerator. It also is the same kind of cycle that's used for air conditioning. Essentially, an air conditioner is just a big refrigerator for your house, right? So the cold reservoir would be your house if it's air conditioning. The hot reservoir would be the outside if it's air conditioning. If you're dealing with a refrigerator, the cold reservoir would be the interior of your refrigerator and the hot reservoir would be your kitchen environment where the condenser for a refrigerator would be the radiator coils in the back of your refrigerator and they dissipate heat into your kitchen. The way we analyze these cycles is using the first law applied around each component. You've done this sort of thing many times so you can apply the first law around the compressor to see what kind of power you need into the compressor. The heat added, that's this heat down here into the evaporator Again, you can apply the first law to find that. By the way, for refrigeration cycles, that heat added is known as the refrigeration capacity. So that's just some terminology. And a common unit you'll see, especially for air conditioning units, is a ton of refrigeration capacity. So they'll say, oh, this is like a three ton air conditioner. The one ton, what that refers to is the rate of heat transfer required to freeze one ton of water in 24 hours. It's kind of a, a strange unit here, but the rate of heat transfer that you need to freeze one ton of water in 24 hours, by the way, to go from a liquid water state to a solid water state, the change in enthalpy required to do that is 334 kilojoules per kilogram. So you can multiply that times one ton is 2,000 pounds mass. You'd have to convert over to kilograms. And then do that over a 24 hour period. What it comes out to be is one ton of refrigeration capacity is about three and a half kilowatts. So if you have a three ton air conditioning unit, it means you could on average freeze three tons of water, turn it into ice within one day. Heat removed, that's the part up here from the condenser going into the hot reservoir or like into your kitchen. If it's a refrigerator, you can do that. First law analysis to find that value. And then if you do the throttling valve, you've done that many times. We know that the specific enthalpy remains the same across that. A typical merit of performance for a refrigeration cycle would be the coefficient of performance. We've talked about that before. That's defined as the heat added. This The heat added is this part here. When I say added, I mean added into the working fluid. So just how much heat can we remove from the cold reservoir divided by how much power we have to put in through the compressor. And you could rearrange that in terms of specific enthalpies by using the expressions above. So all of this analysis we're familiar with. We've done it many times in, in various homework problems. So there's nothing new here. It's pretty much review. And then the note I have here just refers to something I've mentioned earlier that real compressors operate best in a vapor environment rather than with a solid liquid vapor mixture. And that's just has to do with the other engineering aspects of the design of a compressor. Uh, just a few other little comments that I'll make, just kind of more informative than anything else. The compressors that are used in most refrigeration units tend to be pretty low efficiency, something like 40 to 55 percent efficiency. They're pretty low and that's just due primarily to cost. Nobody wants to go out and buy a $3,000 refrigerator. They want to keep it as cheap as possible, so they tend to use lower efficiency compressors. They're just not designed as well. What drives a lot of consumers is cost, not necessarily efficiency. The working fluid in these refrigeration cycles is typically a refrigerant. In the past, it would be something like Freon. That was back decades ago. That caused a lot of damage to the ozone layer, so they outlawed it. Now in homes for like air conditioning units, 
R22 is a common refrigerant that's used. In uh, cars, for example, R134A is a common refrigerant. A lot of our examples use R134A. These refrigerants are much better for ozone depletion, but they still cause a lot of global warming when they're leaked into the environment. So there's actually a lot of research that's being spent on trying to find better refrigerants. Refrigerants that have the right properties so that they work for a typical refrigerator or air conditioning environment. You know, they have to get cold enough so that you can get the heat transfer here and get hot enough so you can get the heat transfer up there. They have to be cheap and benign to the environment as much as possible. So there's a lot of research that's spent on that. That's it for this lecture.